great to see you guys here. So, uh, what I, you know, I've always wanted to, these last few months, I've been doing a lot of studying on fellowship and stuff. And even for myself, you know, and I'm not pointing any fingers here because there's no fingers to be pointed except at myself, you know. But over the last few months, I've uh, done a lot of studying on fellowship and, uh, you know, and I kind of reflect on the fact that I never gave fellowship that much importance in the past. And uh, so anyways, uh, you know, through that study, this, this scripture's always stuck out at me. And uh, of course, we don't get our doctrine for salvation here, but uh, this is applicable to any dispensation as far as assembling. So in uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Well, the day that we look for, the day that we see approaching is of course the day when we hear the shout of Jesus Christ, we hear the trump and Christ calls us up into the clouds to meet him in the air. So that's the day that we look for. So again, this, this in the context here is not for our own salvation, but we can glean the truth that throughout all dispensations, God desires that his people come together. And that's not something that's uh, unique to the dispensation that the 12 apostles were part of. Oh, <laughs> sorry. I didn't know if you want to surprise everybody or not. <laughs> Sneak in here, buddy. Come on in, Mike. Have a seat. Hebrews 10, bud. We got the king's chair up here for you. <laughs> That's the baptism chair. <laughs> so at any rate, uh, Mike, we just we just started, so you hadn't missed a thing here. So uh, anyway, so. With that said, reading uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, and uh, just talking about the assembling of ourselves and how this is something that transcends throughout all the ages. In fact, we see uh, in the ages to come that God's going to gather all of us together in one. So that's the assembling of ourselves. So it's definitely something not just unique to one dispensation. So. With that said, you know, <clears throat> we'll start off with the power of God unto salvation, as Paul says in uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. So with that said, you know, a lot of us are looking for power today. A lot of us are looking for uh, <clears throat> things to, to enrich our lives, to you know, make us seem more important than what we are. And Christ has given us that through his own sacrifice on the cross. <coughs> he died to pay the price for all our sins, past, present, and future. He was buried, and he rose again on the third day for our justification. And by simply believing that, we receive the power of God. And it's, uh, I always feel good, you know, when I hear other preachers, you know, say that, you know, tell us the gospel of Christ. I always feel, wow. That is the power of God. It really makes me feel good inside knowing that I have a Savior through Jesus Christ. And if you don't have a Savior through Jesus Christ, you can have one right now by simply trusting the simple gospel of Christ. How that Christ died for your sins and was buried and rose again on the third day. And it's just as simple as that. And, you know, there comes a, there comes a problem with simplicity uh, in our day and age. We think that we've become so smart by all the technology that we have, by all the schools we have, by how many years of college or, you know, uh, doctorates, degrees, or, you know, seminaries, whatever have you. Uh, we've become so smart that we don't like to see things as simple. And yet, in spite of the lack of technology or in spite of technology, uh, God has made the gospel of Christ so simple 
that it's hard sometimes for people to accept that simplicity because they don't want it to be that simple. And in light of that, we have a, a term that's been coined by uh, Brother Gregory Allen. He's a preacher out of Alabama. And he's coined the term high-tech grace believers. Mm -hmm. And these are individuals who at one time trusted the simple gospel of Christ, how that Christ died for our sins and was buried and rose again on the third day. And after years of study, after years of rightly dividing, they have come to the conclusion that that simple gospel is not enough. And hence we have high-tech grace believers because they have ascended to the point of knowledge where they are so puffed up that they can't see the simplicity of the gospel anymore. And there seems to be two prevailing heresies going on right now through grace churches. And one is that uh, the gospel of Christ is not enough. And the other is that somehow Peter and the 12 or the 11 and their disciples all started preaching the same gospel that Paul preached. And those are the two prevailing heresies going on right now within grace churches. Not all grace churches, but uh, there's actually uh, two or three families right here in Austin uh, that aren't here right now that have ascribed to this high-tech grace bleases of now. And... Uh, Sorry to interject, but you're saying that the high techies are the ones that believe that the message from Peter and the Eleven is the message for them today? Uh, or no. Or think that they're the same message as Paul? Uh, well, you know, and there, there's another term here that uh, Brother uh, uh, <clears throat> Bob Rayburn, uh, he coined the term uh, uh, Thinneyism. And that would be the term for that that sect of belief where they believe that uh, Peter and the eleven and their disciples stopped preaching the gospel of the kingdom but started preaching the gospel of Christ and that somehow uh, all Peter's books, James books, Hebrews, all those somehow now actually match what Paul wrote. And just on the face value of that, I mean we can see that doesn't make any sense and that's not true, but yet, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to, com to compete with a seducing spirit. I can't be with somebody all the time to share the truth with them. You can't be with them all the time to share the truth with them. So what happens is during our daily lives throughout the week, you know, they may not come to Bible study every other week. Seducing spirits have their effect on people, even on people who call themselves grace believers. And that's why it's so uh, important to stay grounded in the simple truth of what the scriptures say. And so we, we see these lines of heresy uh, permeating through different churches uh, around the country. And it's important that you guys know about this because it does affect us here. And if we don't know what the enemy is up to, then we don't know what to look for. And as long as we stay focused on the truth, then we can see those heresies and say, hey, wait a second, that doesn't sound right. So the <clears throat> high-tech grace believer, George, is uh, somebody who believes that 1 Corinthians 15 is not enough now for salvation. They have to add something else onto that. Works? Uh, no, not necessarily works, but what it comes down to is that you have to fully understand every single minute point that happened uh, through Christ on the cross, what happened, all your sins, uh, and Basically, what it comes down to is you have to understand the full mystery now before you can get saved. So what does that have to do with high tech? I think that's fine. Well, Puffed up, yeah. it is, but... Yeah, I don't know. What, is, uh, what does that have to do with just a term Because they all have iPhones. Huh? Yeah. I mean, I was just curious. <laughs> <laughs> I think of high tech as computer and... Right.
Right. You know, all that. It's like Today, that it's no different than thousands of years ago. Right. Well, I think it has to do with knowledge, right? Right. Whether knowledge be, puffs us up. You know, education or education in the way of computers. Yeah, you just all, you know, it's high, high mindedness or puff up. And Jerry, you, you are completely right. There is nothing new under the sun. Paul even experienced this himself, in a, and he wrote about it. So you're right. There's nothing new about this. But I'm just curious. Yeah, and you're completely right. But, you know, just for fun and just to kind of put a label on it, uh, high-tech grace believer is now the new term for that. So, so oh, okay. they expect to know all the prophecy, kingdom, mystery. Exactly. And you, that, you, isn't that just basically rightly dividing though? Yeah, and you have to know everything about rightly dividing before you can be, be saved. saved. Before Corinthians comes into play in your life. Absolutely. How do they justify that? Well, that's a good question because God laid it out in order. He said God's will is to have all men be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. So there is an order that God laid out for us to be saved first and then come unto the knowledge of the truth. So So that justifies us. How, how do they justify their idealism? Well, it, it's a seducing spirit is what it is because it, it's not based upon sound biblical knowledge. It's based upon their erroneous views on Scripture. And, you know, Satan blinds the minds of those who don't believe. So if you're not going to believe what God says, how it goes in order of, uh, to be saved first, then come unto the knowledge of truth. They have it turned around backwards, where you have to come unto the knowledge of the truth first, yeah. then be saved. I know for myself, I, I had no idea what rightly dividing was, didn't know what a grace believer was. I just knew I needed to have a Savior, Jesus Christ. So I trusted Christ long before I ever knew anything about rightly dividing the word of truth. Mike? Same here. <clears throat> you know, I think about... Uh, Paul and um, you know scripture is very clear that he's our example you know and um, I, I was thinking you know how he, he was so well you know versed in Old Testament scripture and you know Pharisee and Hebrew and one Hebrew I mean you know he was you know number one Jew you know and uh, and so I can see how somebody high tech, whatever you want to call them, would say, hey, he had all this knowledge before he got saved. Yeah. But if you really look, he, he couldn't get saved under that because he was a blasphemer. He got saved under something else. Once that happened, he got the ministry committed to him. He yeah. got understanding of what was going on. You know, I can see how someone said, well, hey, Paul had all this knowledge before he got saved, and he had to have all this knowledge, you know, so whatever, his yeah. conversion happened, whatever. But really, you know, that's not the case, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. you, can, you can clearly see that, you know, he, that had nothing to do with it, you know? Well, what happened to Paul does not happen to people nowadays. I mean, God doesn't open up the sky and throw down a huge light and say... You know, things, things to people. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, it just seems silly. Well, he was saying that Paul was educated in a lot of things in before he got saved. Yeah. But there was one thing that was preventing him from truly being saved, and that was because he was a blasphemer. Right. So, based on that, he was a lost person, like each and every one of us. So, right. it doesn't matter what you know right now, if you're not saved, you're not saved. If you don't accept Christ as your Savior, you ain't saved. Yeah. Whether you can rightly like it or not. No matter how much knowledge you have. <clears throat> Understanding of the mystery and everything else that, you know, <clears throat> that came afterwards, you know? It was revealed after. Yeah, yeah. Never known before. So he was a, a Jew of Jews and doing exactly what he thought was right in the eyes of the Lord. But you know, if you think about it, if he'd have known the scriptures, But he wouldn't have known, yeah, that, but he wouldn't have known that he died on the cross for sins. But then again, nobody knew except, uh, yeah. nobody knew that Jesus was the Messiah. I think the fact that he was a Pharisee also put him up on that yeah. pedestal of knowledge. Sure. Right. He, he would have been the high techie of his day, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Yeah, really. Yeah, that's a good correlation, really. 
So at any rate, we, ha we have this one line of thinking here, and uh, this line of thinking is actually uh, uh, has subverted whole households here in Austin. There is two families now who have gone either to Jerry or, or, or Scott's church at one point or another, and now they, they, uh, their quote is, oh, you're one of those 1 Corinthian 15ers now. Oh, boy, another mm -hmm. tag. Yeah. So, who, to you? Uh, no, to us in general who, oh. who believe the gospel of Christ. Oh, so, okay. uh, Do they not believe the gospel of tri uh, Christ? No, they believe that it's uh, something yeah. more. That's something more of getting the knowledge first before getting saved. It, it's hard to put, uh, it's hard to put uh, an exact wording to it because if you can, and I have tried to uh, speak with this person one-on-one -on -one more or less, and it gets very vague and very kind of, you know, if you try to, if you try to pin them down on what exactly they're trying to say to you that, okay, so fine, 1 Corinthians 15 isn't the gospel, then you tell me what it is. Then they get real ambiguous about, oh, well, you know, you got to kind of understand this and then you got to understand. This. So, you know, it, it just becomes nonsense when you start talking to them. But anyway, so... We have that line of heresy going on. And, you know, the thing that amazes me is, uh, you know, last year, I guess, I guess June or July, I started hearing this line of thinking from this person, this family. And I said, where is this coming from? I mean, this doesn't make any sense. And then other people started ascribing to it. And I was just kind of flabbergasted for a few weeks, a few months. I was like, I can't believe this. I mean, somebody who has heard the truth of rightly dividing and heard the gospel of Christ for, you know, three, four, five years, and now they're turning away from it. I said, I can't understand. How can this be? And, you know, it just, it really caught me off guard. I mean, I was, I was taken aback. I, you know, it. It made me really sad and upset because I couldn't believe this. I mean, this this person was really close to uh, local preachers here, so uh, so it really hurt me. And uh, and then, sure enough, there started to become this other new doctrine popping up within Grace churches, and so, not not in all, but in a few churches around the country. I said, where is this coming? And again, I was flabbergasted. I mean, I cannot believe where something like this would come from. And I said, surely, I mean, people who are grounded and rightly dividing, grounded in the King James Bible, grounded in all the truth, how can this happen? And I just couldn't understand it. And, you know, but on the plus side, for me as myself, uh, getting up here and speaking with you all and then eventually going to Florida to speak at a congregation there. You know, all Romans 8, 28, all things happen together for good that, uh, to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So even though some bad things were happening to local believers, it was actually a good thing for me because I know for myself, I spent the majority of my uh, learning under Jerry Lockhart, a few years with Scott Mitchell, and I have been resting on other men's works. I have been resting on the teachings that they have given me. And I hadn't really studied it out myself. You know, I, whatever Jerry had said, I said, you know, that makes sense. He's shown it to me in the Bible, so I don't have a problem with it. And this actually forced me to actually study these things out myself. And so in a, in a, in a sense, it was good because like I said, I was resting on somebody else's work. And so this helped me see the errors of these people and helped me see the errors of these new doctrines and stuff. So let's, let's talk about this other doctrine that has come up recently. And the title of this study today is Love Thy Neighbor. And... Some have swerved to vain jangling, and some have followed seducing spirits. This new doctrine 
one of the many tenets of this new doctrine, Athenaism, is that somehow the term love thy neighbor as thyself has replaced the law of Moses. And we are going to see if that is true. So what I wanted to do first was I want to go around and ask everybody, how are you supposed to love your neighbor? So, Kim, we'll start with you. And there's no wrong or right answers here. We're just not a trick question or anything. Just whatever you think how to love your neighbor. Like my actual neighbor or just... <laughs> <laughs> your neighbor right now. <laughs> well... <laughs> just talk on your current neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Um, I would say, for the most part, to be aware, but give most you know, give people the, the benefit of the doubt until proven differently um you know be kind you know um it, it's unfortunately a, a sad world <laughs> that uh you know you you know many people can um hurt you in one way or another but you know i feel like to begin with and and you know just speaking with people to you know give people the benefit of the doubt and you know have that foundation of trust at first and hope it all works out well. <laughs> Thank you. Eric? What? I, I think it's you know very similar to like the golden rule. You want them to treat you the way or you treat them the way you will want them to treat you and then you know you're you have an open relationship with your neighbor too. You got you want to get to know them. You don't want to be completely blind to what your neighbors are doing. Mm -hmm. I think you want to have that openness. So just you know, having that interaction, I think, helps and that, you know, it's like knowing them, knowing your neighbors, you know. Not necessarily because you want to, like, form an opinion, but just, you know, so you know, it's an awareness. It's, you know, if I needed help, you know, is my neighbor there for, to help me? Uh, if they require my help, you know, I'm certainly willing to help them more because I know more about them, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Pete? And I ain't gonna lie, all of this is nice, but I mean, you know, 
Are you guys live? Don't I mean, you have I big mean, lots there and trees in between? Far I don't want to know my neighbors. You can't even see your neighbor. Can you? I might let them in. Welcome to my I'm house. I'm nice. <laughs> this is tr this is real. I'm not lying. I am nice. Yeah. Cat, you know. Yeah. But. You stay on your fence line, I stay on my fence. Best neighbors at home. I mean, I'm, I'm not lying. I am nice, but I was reading <laughs> over here, and it says, to love your neighbor as yourself means that you put your neighbor's needs above your own. Did anybody do that? No. You should show love, kindness, concern, and lay aside selfish desires. Can we all do that? My answer is no. Only God can help us. Can help us love others. We should through the Holy Spirit, through His Holy Spirit. We cannot do it alone. I believe that. I can't do it by myself. Yeah. Too much flesh going on. <laughs> yeah. We are too selfish, but God helps us to love others as we should, as we should when we turn to Him and ask Him for help. I'm that person. I can't do it alone. So if I need to bite my tongue, I need you to help. I'm that person too. I, <laughs> There's no right or wrong answer. I, mean, <laughs> I need all the help I can get from God too. You know, I had I had some real bad neighbors one time. They were in Mexico, and they oh, it was a nightmare. They uh, their dog would bring their pampers and bury them in my yard in my flower bed. I had just made a big flower bed, and he would bring the peppers and bury them in my flower bed. Even the dog knew I didn't like them. And and then he would come, and he would get in my bird bath to drink water and almost topple it over. I mean, and then the men, they would have these parties right, on Friday. Let's uh, all turn to Galatians chapter 5. So I know, I've been there. I know what you're talking about. Galatians chapter 5. <laughs> yeah, it was horrific. <laughs> Galatians chapter 5, and we'll be in verse 14. All right, so here we have see in Galatians chapter 5, verse 14, For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Mm -hmm. Now, this new group, the Athenians, they want to put a private interpretation on this verse right here. Because, ask yourself, I have a cup of coffee sitting over there on the top, on the table over there. It's half full. Now, if I were to fill it up, fulfill the cup of coffee, do I take away that cup and that the rest of the coffee that's in it? No. No. You have a glass of water back there. It's half full. If you were to fulfill that, you would just fill it to the top, but the glass and the rest of the water would still be there. Now, the private interpretation that these, uh, this new doctrine wants to put on this verse is that somehow the law is done away with. Somehow that the law is uh, completely nullified by that verse right there. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, we're going to see that that's simply not true. So, <clears throat> is there anybody who doesn't understand that? So, fulfilling something, what I like, my personal favorite example is when I get an ice cream sundae, you get a brownie, ice cream, whipped cream on top with a little hot fudge on it, but to fulfill that sundae, they put a cherry on top. Does that cherry negate the rest of the sundae? No, it fulfills the sundae. So, just keep that in mind. Uh, let's turn to Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 19. I have to look that one up. Yeah, me too. That's where my Bible starts looking new again.
Leviticus chapter 19, we are going to uh, see the first usage of love thy neighbor. So to me, I always like to look at first usage of a term or a word. And here we see the first usage of what we had just read in Galatians chapter 5, verse 14. So in Leviticus chapter 19, we'll start in verse um, or actually, we are going to start in verse 1. So, <clears throat> verse 1 of Leviticus chapter 19. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, and say unto them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Ye shall fear every man his mother and his father, and keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Turn you not unto idols, nor make to yourselves molten gods. I am the Lord your God. And if ye offer a sacrifice of peace offerings unto the Lord, you shall offer it at your own will. It shall be in the same day you offer it, and on the morrow. And if aught, if aught remain until the third day, it shall be burnt in the fire. And if it be eaten at all on the third day, it is abominable. It shall not be accepted. Therefore, every one that eateth it shall bear his iniquity, because he hath profaned the hallowed things of the Lord. And the soul shall be cut off from among the people. And when you... And when ye reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of the field, neither shalt thou gather the gleanings of thy harvest. <clears throat> and thou shalt not glean thy vineyard, neither shalt thou gather every grape of the vineyard. Thou shalt leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am the Lord your God. So uh, just keep that in mind. Thou shalt leave them for the poor and the stranger. Verse 11, you shall not steal, neither deal falsely, neither lie one to another. And you shall not swear by my name falsely, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God, I am the Lord. Thou shalt not defraud thy neighbor, neither rob him. The wages of him that is hired shall not abide with thee all night until the morning. Now that's something to think about, even for those of you who get paid on a weekly basis. That's still uh, against God's commandments. So if you work or you uh, hire somebody to work, you should be paying them every day. But of course, that's according to the law. We're not under the law. But just a little uh, caveat there. <clears throat> Verse 14. Thou shalt not curse the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind, but shalt fear thy God, I am the Lord. Ye shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. But in righteousness thou shalt judge thy neighbor. Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among thy people, neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor. I am the Lord. Verse 17. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thy heart. Thou shalt not in any wise rebuke thy neighbor, and not suffer sin upon him. Verse 18, thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. So there, in verse 18, we have the first usage of love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, this is all in the context of the law that God gave to Moses. Does anybody doubt that at all? This is God giving the law of Moses to Moses, or the law to Moses. So <clears throat> we could go ahead and read back through a lot of different chapters in Leviticus, and we can read a lot of different things here. But just think for a moment what you just read. In verse 19, it gives you specific things to do to love thy neighbor as thyself. <clears throat> Such as verse 11, you shall not deal falsely, neither uh, lie one to another. Uh, <clears throat> verse 14, thou shalt not curse the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind. So that's loving your neighbor as yourself. That's God giving us specific instructions on how to love our neighbors ourselves. Now, what I heard everybody here say wasn't necessarily wrong. 
Uh, everybody said something slightly different. But here in the Law of Moses, we have specific uh, rules on exactly how to love our neighbor as ourself. Now, <clears throat> with this, as we're talking about this new doctrine, what happens is these individuals say that love thy neighbor as thyself is a replacement for the law. And yet, if you take the law away, you're taking away verse 18, because that's part of the law of Moses. So you can't have it both ways. You can't say that that verse is a replacement for the law when it's actually part of the law itself. So if you throw the law away, you're throwing that verse away. So <clears throat> I just want you guys to see the first usage of that term. And now let's jump back to Matthew 19. We're going to look at Matthew 19, <clears throat> and we are going to look at how it's used when Jesus Christ walked the earth. <clears throat> Matthew 19. And uh, we're going to start in verse 16. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good things shall I do that I may have eternal life? And Jesus Christ, he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He saith unto him, Which? Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt... Or, uh, Verse 19, honor thy father and mother, and thou shalt love the neighbor as thyself. So here we see Jesus Christ himself reiterating what he had already said in the law. So we find a compatibility between the law of Moses and Christ on the earth. So just keep that in mind. <clears throat> but something else that's kind of struck me about this. Here we are in uh, Matthew 19, and we see in verse 19, love thy neighbor as thyself. Where did we read it in Leviticus in chapter 19? So somehow or other, 19 seems to be a trending type of numerical value with that term. So I don't know what that means. I just thought it was kind of cool that you can find 19 three times associated with the exact same verse. So if anybody knows, uh, if anybody's read Bullinger's book on numbers or anything, it'd be fun to find out it's what... It's called Jerry. Yeah, it's called Jerry. Uh, so back in Hebrews, we were in 19? Uh, chapter 19. No, Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus, Matthew, and what's the third one? Uh, Matthew, we're in the book of... This 19th book of okay. Matthew and the 19th verse. Okay, I so I just thought that was really cool. And I didn't have time to really study on what's going on with that. But I just wanted to throw that out there to you guys and see if you could run with it. But uh, anyways, let's turn now to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. Okay. In Romans chapter uh, 13, verse 9. Uh, okay. Um. Let's see, let's jump up to verse 6. For this cause pay you tribute also, for they that are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth one another hath fulfilled the law. Verse 9, for this 
Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in the same, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Here we see our Apostle Paul now talking about this term. And what does he do? He gives a little list of the law, and then he says, love thy neighbor as thyself. But what does he say about that? <clears throat> he says that the law is briefly comprehended. If you can comprehend everything that goes into the law, a brief statement of that would be, love thy neighbor as thyself. Does that negate the rest of the law? No. It's a brief summary of the law. Because every time somebody says, keep the law, and they say, oh yeah, what? which one? As the rich man did to Jesus. Jesus is not going to repeat over 600 different individual laws to each and every person. And neither can we, neither can any prophet, unless they have a week to go. So God allows us the ability to summarize the law of Moses by saying, it's briefly comprehended in this saying. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Does not get rid of the law of Moses. It's just a summary of the law of Moses. So, <clears throat> with that, with Paul's uh, statement on that, let's turn now to James chapter 2. James chapter 2. James chapter 2, and we're going to be in verse 8. Verse 8, if you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Ye do well. Okay, so we have four, uh, four confirmations here. That, is there any doubt in anybody's mind as we speak right now? Is there any doubt that Love thy neighbor as thyself is in relationship to the law of Moses. Any doubt whatsoever? There shouldn't be. Is, is there anybody here who thinks it's okay to throw out context? Just pick a word or a phrase out of the scriptures and not... Oh, and use it to your benefit. Right. Um, <clears throat> let's read... Uh, Let's read, I want to read to you some of James here, chapter 2, verse 5. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he had promised to them that love him? Hey, Steve, glad you guys made it. <laughs> All right, uh, we are in uh, James chapter 2. Uh, verse, I was just starting in verse 8, and we're talking about the uh, love thy neighbor as thyself. <clears throat> so in verse 6, uh, but you have the despised the poor, do not rich men oppress you and draw you before judgment seats. Boy, right there, how, how familiar does that sound in our day and age right here in this country? It says, uh, rich men oppress you and draw you before judgment seats it happens all the time so not much has changed since the days of jesus it's still rich men oppressing us and drawing us before uh, courts to uh, take something from us verse 7 do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which ye are called verse 8 if you fulfill the royal law according to scripture thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself ye do well but if you have respect to persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law's transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now if thou, shalt, uh, now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. 
so speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Okay, so <clears throat> just for context sake, we can't take anything out of context, right? So we have in verse 8, we have the royal law and verse 9, we just have law. Uh, verse 11, we have law. Uh, and verse 12, we have the law of liberty. I spoke briefly last week or the week before on the law of liberty and how compared to our current judicial and governmental system, 600 laws versus thousands and tens of thousands of laws would be lib uh, liberating. Uh, but is there anybody here that doubts that the context of James chapter 2 is all within the law of Moses? Is there anybody that doubts that? Christ is on the scene now. He has ascended to high next to the right hand of God. He is the king of kings, lord of lords. So, of course, they're going to say now, after that fact, it's the royal law. Christ is the king. It's his royal law. You're not going to have a kingdom without a set of laws. It's not just going to be a free love type of scenario like uh, some people want to say these days. So we have the royal law, 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 liberty, and I'm sure there's a few more in there. The context is the law. We can't throw that out. So as we we're looking at context and we have four points of proofs now, there's no doubt whatsoever <clears throat> that... <clears throat> In verse 8, if you fulfill the royal law according to scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. It's within the context of the law of Moses. You cannot throw the law of Moses out without throwing that verse out too. So that verse, love thy neighbor as thyself, is not a replacement for the law of Moses. So, <clears throat> uh, so what do we have here? We have... Leviticus, God giving Moses the law, saying, love thy neighbor as thyself. We have Jesus Christ himself reiterating the law of Moses and saying, love thy neighbor as thyself. We see James over here doing exactly as Christ told them to do as a man who walked the earth. He said, love thy neighbor as thyself. Then we have Paul comes onto the scene. Hey, Kim. And as we saw in uh, Romans chapter, uh, yeah, Romans chapter thirteen, Paul reiterates that loving thy neighbor as thyself is a brief summary of the law of Moses. Okay, so there's no doubt in that whatsoever. So now let's turn back to Romans chapter ten, because <clears throat> Christ told Peter in the eleven. He told them to keep his commandments. He told them to keep the law. Now we know that the law does not save anybody because Peter and the eleven had to first believe that Christ was the Son of God before they could be saved. But after that point, they had to keep the works that went with that. And I know that's hard for us to wrap our mind around, and that's okay. They're, just as Peter told uh, his followers, it's hard for them to wrap their mind around the salvation we have, faith without works, by simply trusting Christ as our Savior and doing no works whatsoever. That's how we are saved today. And yet that was hard for Peter and his believers to wrap their mind around. So it's okay if we can't fully wrap our mind around it. this book here before us, King James Bible, God's Word, is not something we're going to be able to fully understand before we die. There's always going to be learning involved in the scriptures. So don't fall into the trap of saying, oh, since I can't understand it, I'm going to go with this philosophy or that philosophy being seduced by seducing spirits. So Romans chapter 10, <clears throat> and we'll start in... Uh, 
Romans chapter 10, and we are, we'll start in verse 1 there. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. So here we see in verse 3, we see Israel rejecting Christ as the Son of God. And they're still trying to keep the law. And that's not going to be good enough. They're not going to be saved through that. So at verse 4, For Christ is the end of the law for righteous, righteousness to everyone that believeth. So here is Paul saying to the people he's speaking to, Christ is the end of the law. The road has come to a dead end. And the law is in no more effect for us, to the people who's Paul speaking to. Was the law in effect for these people? Yep. But Christ is the end of the law for us. Let's turn back to Romans chapter 4. <clears throat> Romans chapter 4. And I guess we'll, uh, we'll start in verse 20. Now this is uh, uh, Paul speaking about Abraham. And uh, verse 20, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was also to, uh, able also to perform. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. So here we see an example of simply believing how righteousness is imputed to a person. Verse 23, now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him. And I, that's right. It was written for our sakes as well. So we can see by the word of God, we can see God himself saying, hey, you believe what I say, and I'm going to impute to you righteousness without works. <clears throat> Verse 24, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord just, uh, Jesus Christ. So here we see that believing on God, who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, Jesus Christ, who was delivered for our offenses. I have offended God many times. We all have offended God many times. And Christ, <clears throat> Christ was delivered because of those offenses on my behalf and on your behalf. And God raised him again for our justification. So those offenses that were imputed to Christ on my behalf, when he rose again the third day, he didn't have those offenses on him. And so Christ or uh, God didn't see any more offenses on my behalf or on Christ. So, verse 1 of chapter 5, Therefore, being justified by faith, the faith of Jesus Christ, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, we can have faith, or we can have peace today through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We can have peace with God by simply trusting what Christ has accomplished on our behalf, placing my offenses on him. Uh, Verse 2, by whom we also have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope and glory of God. So here we see uh, that we're standing within the grace of God. We're standing within uh, the justification of Jesus Christ. So uh, with that said, that pretty much wraps up what I wanted to talk about today. And I, I hope I've shown you that uh, there's individuals out there who are putting a private interpretation on love thy neighbor as thyself as somehow as a replacement for the law of Moses, which we see is simply not the case because you would be throwing out uh, the baby with the bathwater. So uh, with that said, I hope this was has been edifying to y'all and uh, it's been really great seeing y'all. Uh,